<sighs> so, nearby Braddles, what is your favourite film that has the exact same premise and story as another film? You always throw these on me. What's yours? You know what? Have a think about it and we'll talk about it at the end of the video. Or is at home, let us know what yours is too. Right. Studio rivalries in regards to cinema aren't exactly rare, and each and every summer you'll find multi-billion dollar companies swinging their dicks around, trying to get you to watch their film at the box office. Have you ever stopped to think, what would happen if these companies set aside their differences and combined their resources, reach, talent, and access to uh, the industry to create one giant genre-defining super film? Well, that's not hypothetical, because in the 1970s, Two studios did do that with the film The Towering Inferno. My mum loves this film. Does she? Okay, so what do you know about The Towering Inferno? Probably not a lot, but I've definitely seen it at least a dozen times. Yes. But I don't remember a huge amount apart from The Towering and The Inferno part of it. Yeah. Well, The Towering Inferno is a classic of the disaster film genre. It's about a skyscraper that catches on fire, hence the name The Towering Inferno. And it boasts a star-studded cast for the time period it was made in. And it's quite literally two movies that were just smushed together and given the backing of two multi-billion dollar corporations working in tandem. Um, perhaps one of the only times in like Hollywood history that has ever really happened. So it was originally two separate films? Originally it was two separate books. Well the story goes that following the success of the Poseidon Adventure, studios were looking for more disaster films to fund and this saw Fox, Warner Bros and Columbia Pictures all starting a bidding war for the rights to option the novel The Tower, which is about a skyscraper that catches on fire. Oh, I thought you were going to say that there was one called The Tower and one called The Inferno, and they were like, you know what? Well, well, Brad, you're not actually too far wrong there. You're jumping ahead in the story a bit. So Warner Bros. won this bidding war and were like, sick, we, we've got the rights to The Tower. We're going to make a huge, awesome movie about a skyscraper that catches on fire based on the novel The Tower by author Daniel Stern, who got a cool $400,000 for the rights to his novel, which is about four times what he probably should have gotten if not for that bidding war I mentioned earlier. But Fox didn't want to, like, you know, just run away with their tails between their legs. And they realised, well, it's not exactly an original premise of a skyscraper that catches on fire. I wonder if there are any other novels out there that are about skyscrapers catching on fire. Hmm, what's this? There's a novel here called The Glass Inferno. <laughs> That's basically the same plot. A skyscraper catches on fire. But, most importantly... But, you know, Warner Bros. have an option this. Let's buy the rights to that novel instead. How did this become one film then? If they've both got their own individual version, surely this is like a, one of those, like an example you mentioned at the start, where it's two films yeah. that end up looking very similar. Well, that's well, that's likely what would have happened, Brad, if not for um, the foresight of the producer for The Tower um, while it was still in production, Irwin Allen. And he recognised that if both movies went to the box office at the same time. They would just cannibalize each other's sales and it would result in each movie making less than it perhaps should have. And if anyone's wondering, this seems kind of weird, two movies with the same premise in like theaters at the same time. Um, and it seems even weirder that the studios behind them would just put them out. Uh, well, it's more common than you'd think, so common in fact, it has a name, twin films. And there are multiple examples of twin films. That's one of my favorites are, you know, White House Down, and Olympus Has Fallen. Yeah. Two films about, um, uh, you know, the White House being invaded by terrorists, which were released within two months of one another. And that's basically the same film, right? But you can say there's differences, like, you know, actors are different, like the tone of each one's different, but the basic plot and premise, pretty much the same. Yeah, John Wick and The Equalizer, another yep. example of that. Also released in the same month, and they even had some of the same actors in them as extras. So if you watch John Wick and The Equalizer back to back, it just looks like the same Eastern European gang had a really bad month. It just looks like they pissed off the two worst people to piss off simultaneously. They were even filming like, roughly the same area as well. Have some of the same landmarks in the back. Oh, imagine surviving John Wick only to get beaten down. Like Robert McCall turns up and just starts sledgehammering his way through your um, uh, your ranks. But yeah, it's really cool. You had uh, Deep Impact Armageddon. Yeah. Two like disaster films about um, uh, like you know meteorites going to hit the Earth. You but, had Bugs Life and Ants were a few months apart. I think. Yeah, but I mean, that was like a case like corporate espionage. It's rumored because it's, uh, it's something Katzberg, the guy who was in basically started DreamWorks. Uh, 
reportedly just stole the idea for a bug's life and just fast track ants into production. Um, you've got what I think is called like was one that's friends with benefits and no strings attached. Yeah. Um, which weirdly just has like Ashton Kutcher in one and Mila Kunis in the other. So like they were like you know husband and wife directly competing with one another at the box office, and the films have the same premise of just two people fucking one another. Which one of those films did better? Well, here's the thing. They probably both did worse than they would have if they weren't competing with another film that was basically the same. And you can say, like, you know, there's differences between the films, but like, you know, to a layperson, to an audience, who just reads, like, you know, the synopsis or sees a trailer, it looks like the same movie. Yeah, and you're not going to pay for two tickets to see what you think is going to be the same. Exactly, yeah. The same experience rather than the same movie. Yeah, and that's what Erwin Allen said. He said, well, we, we can forge ahead, both try and, like, you know, release two movies with basically the same plot, and compete with each other and cannibalize each other's sales and make less money than we ordinarily would have. But this is a bad idea because even back then in the 70s, there was already a precedent for this. And he noted that there was an Oscar Wilde biopic that was made that was released the same week as another Oscar Wilde biopic. And they both just like stunk up at the box office because obviously you go there and you see two Oscar Wilde box Now you're like, is it also, is it biopic or biopic? I say biopic. I say biopic. Yeah, well, I've heard other people. Either way, like they, they both, like, you know, just ate shit at the box office because like you know they did all right but when there's another film that has basically the same plot you just go watch you know it's 50 50 at that point isn't it didn't we have four pinocchio films last year yep i don't believe my eyes your name will be pinocchio um all released within six months of each other there might be people out there wondering like well how does this even happen like how do you end up with say for example like two films about you know meteorites hitting the earth released within like a month of each other at the box office like how do they get written and put into production around the same time without anyone in the industry knowing about the other one existing chances are the execs at every studio know what every other exec studio is working on yeah and the answer is like well they do and they don't care and because like you know hollywood is run by ego and narcissism even when studios learn that someone else is putting out a near identical film they very seldom back down compromise or just give up and that's how you end up with stuff like, you know, Armageddon and Deep Impact. It's like, well, our film's better, it's going to make more money. All the time in the world. We have 18 minutes to zero barrier. He's all they've got. Yeah, I, I would have assumed it was a case of, like, a script is being passed around. If it gets passed over, that doesn't, like you said, if it's a similar enough concept, that doesn't mean you can't just do your own version of it. Yeah, you can just go find someone who wrote a similar film. And you might be wondering, well, how do these scripts with similar ideas make it onto desk at the same time? And... For example, the, the example of Deep Impact and Armageddon is that but it seems really strange until you realise like two or three years before Deep Impact and Armageddon like were at the box office, there was like a rash of news reports about um, uh, giant meteorites that were close to hitting the Earth. And obviously, you do the math in your head, like, okay, two, three years, a screenwriter heard about that, wrote a story about it, it got passed around Hollywood, it got options, like, you know, they did nothing with it for a year, they entered into production, another studio, and it's like, yeah. It's like calculating when a pregnancy started, isn't it? And that's basically what you do when you see twin films like that. You just go back two, three years and like, okay, what was big in the news that would have inspired people to write these scripts? And in the case of uh, White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen, White House Down was a failed Die Hard pitch. Oh. Because for anyone who doesn't know, like, after the first Die Hard movie, um, they went to Bruce Willis for the sequel and said, okay, we've got like 18 generic scripts here for man saves, like, you know, insert location from terrorists. Which one do you want? And they just reworked it into a Die Hard script, which is another thing you can do. And then for White House Down, that was a, a pitch for John McClane saves the White House. That never went anywhere, so it got retooled and turned into um, uh, White House Down. Does that mean that Bruce Willis chose Die Hard 5? But, uh, I guess he did, yeah. That wasn't great. Which is the thing of, like, you know, on paper it might look better than it ended up yeah, being. But, like, you know, White House Down was originally a failed Die Hard um, pitch. And the rumour is that so was Olympus Has Fallen. Oh. So they were failed. And the thing is, in White House Down, you would have a nod to that because Channing Tatum is wearing like the John McClane um, uh, vest throughout the entire movie. My little girl is counting on me right now and I'm not going to disappear on her. And most likely pulls it off better. That's, I always like the way John McClane pulled it off. He's got that everyman quality about him that, yeah, Ch that Channing Tatum doesn't. He's not like super hench. He's not super like, I guess, handsome generically. He, he does look like just a normal cop. Like, well, that's the idea. He's, like, he's the average man. That's why in like Die Hard 2, it's like, how's the same shit happen to the same guy twice? Because I think, so, so, remember when I like, watched the Barbie movie came out? Yeah. It was like a huge rollicking success. What's like, you know, um, uh, every studio done, just option every Hasbro property they can have. It's not that they want to make, because the headline people probably saw is like, there's like 15 different Hasbro properties like um, uh, 
pinned to have a film made. It's like, no, they optioned the rights, which is not the same as making a film. It just means that no one else can make a film with those rights in the time period they paid for. It's the wrong lesson to take away. Like, the Barbie movie did well because it, it was a good film that came at the right time. You can go back to your regular life, or you can know the truth about the universe. The choice is now yours. The first one, the high heel. You have to want to know, okay? Do it again. Same with the Marvel, but we've talked about this to death, haven't we? Like, people saw the success of the Marvel Universe and went, well, do people like well-crafted movies with actors who, like, embody the character they're playing that has a cohesive vision and um, uh, thrust behind it? Well, that's going towards, like, a, um, a predetermined endgame, you know, pun intended. Um, that will have a satisfying conclusion that, like, you know, closes all the threads off that were um, uh, weaved out throughout production. It's like, no, they're like superheroes, make more superhero movies. Same with the Barbie movie, of, like, do people enjoy this movie because it's a well-crafted movie from a director with a vision, with actors who enjoyed the script they were making and fully understood the material that's aimed at and for women and young girls with an empowering message for them? You know, a traditionally, like, you know, under-marketed to demographic. It's like, no, it's because it's about toys. That's what they're gonna make. Lego movie, the exact same thing. Yeah, happens. it's about toys. Like Bugs Life. Well, it's because it's about bugs. It's like, no, it's because it's a good fucking movie. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, back to Towering Inferno. Towering um, Irwin Allen was like pointing to the historical examples of twin films and the multiple times that it just fucked over either studio. It's like very rarely does either studio come out on top. Like, and the best case scenario is one studio makes a little bit more money than the other, and they both turn a profit but a little bit of profit. That's like the absolute best case scenario. Worst case scenario, you both make a loss. Yeah. And he said, well, instead, why don't you combine the two scripts, your budgets, your reach, your resources, and just make the definitive Skyscraper Catches on Fire movie. And it was great. Well, that's well the, the, the little bit I can remember where the lobby's on fire, that mm -hmm. bit was good. Well, that's the thing, because now they had not just, you know, two movies put into one, they had two budgets. And the thrust of Irwin Allen's argument is, well, the nature of this film means that we're going to have to build and then destroy very costly sets. If we have the backing of two studios, we can make the sets even bigger and more elaborate. Double the fire. Yeah, that's mean we can have twice. We can burn down twice as much stuff. It's like this is going to be by, by its nature a very expensive film to make because we're going to have to burn half the sets down. We have to build these giant sets to burn them down. With two budgets, we can make the film like I said, the definitive building catches on fire movie. It also gives us access to like you know double the amount of resources in terms of marketing because then you know you know for a fact you've now got no competition at the box office because your closest rival is promoting your movie for you. It would make a good story as well. Like, if I heard that two studios are teamed up to make a better movie with a super budget, you'd be like, well, it's got to be good then. Well, that's exactly what they did because um, Warner Bros. and Fox issued a joint statement saying like it's as if GM and Chrysler teamed up to make the finest automobile on the market. We are combining our resources to create the movie of the summer. They did. And like, you know, it made a hundred million dollars at the box office, which, you know, it was a lot of money back then. It's on, not a lot of money a, now. What was it on a budget of, do you know? I think like five, 10 million, I think. God, the difference between then yeah, and Yeah, that's it, that'd be the mark, that like the marketing budget for Barbie was 200 million. So the market, like, oh. the marketing budget, but then again, Barbie made a billion dollars. It did, but they didn't know that when they went into it. I think they did. I think when they put Ryan Gosling in that costume, they went, <laughs> this is going to make a billion dollars. Oh, God. I, I've now seen it. Uh, obviously, I mean, I guess there's no point in saying spoilers because it made a billion. Like, everyone's yeah, seen it. Everyone's seen it. My, 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 my 10 quid. I think I, I heard today Ryan Gosling's being put forward for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. And Best Song. Oh, Best Song? Best Song. I he is kin off. He is. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. And if you've not realised already, folks at home, the title of the film, The Towering Inferno, as you mentioned, Brad, is a combination of The Tower and The Glass Inferno. In addition to combining the names, they also took characters and concepts from both. And which, you know, makes it sound like a success, but there was some um, drama behind the scenes because when they combined the two films into one, they, all, the lead actors? they also got both lead actors. Ooh. So they had Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. And both men were promised the lead in a big disaster movie. And now there was just one big disaster movie, but two leads. And thus arose the question of, well, who is the true lead? Who gets top billing? They should have, they should have made them a couple. 
That would have been a great story. Well, well that's the thing of like because Steve McQueen and uh, Paul Newman, like behind the scenes, just fucking hated each other. They were arguing all the time, and they got so petty about who got top billing. And when I say top billing, I mean literally they were arguing about whose name was at the top of the poster. Because if you ever wondered why, like movie posters suck so much ass. Oh man, we've talked about this before, where. If there's like a poster with a lineup of people, yep. the names never correspond. Yeah, you know, a Fast and Furious movie. You look at it, it's like, oh, there's all the characters. And then you'll read the names on top and they do not correlate with the person's like position in the lineup on the poster. Yeah. And that's because those two things are decided upon differently. Like the art department picks which photo they're going to use, but then the marketing department has to figure out whose name goes first, who gets top billing. Normally, actors have it written into their contracts where their name goes. It's such a very specific example of how ego is like overtakes art. Yeah, and the problem with the Towering Inferno one is, is that neither man would back down, and they like they both said, "I want top billing." So let me let me guess. They did two separate posters. No, they did something even stupider. But when the film comes up, it's like they had to have both their names on screen at the same time, both at centre, both appearing for the exact same amount of time. Well, how do you decide who's at, like? Unless they're on top of each other. They no, they just have them both in line with each other and they've both got top billing in the film's credits. But for the but post... who's on left and who's on right? That doesn't matter. But for <laughs> the alphabetically, you get away with the alphabet. But for the poster, they had to come up with like a pretty ingenious solution that makes the poster look just so fucking wank. And the solution they came up with is, is they wrote the names diagonally. So you have Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. But... If you can see there, Brad, like, look, Steve McQueen is lower than Paul Newman's. Yeah. But Steve McQueen's is on the left. So, oh, if, fuck so if, you read it oh, le- no. if you read it left to right, Steve McQueen has top billing. If you read it top to bottom, Paul Newman has top billing. Oh, what and that's the... Oh, and keep in mind, you might think that's stupid. They tried to pitch a version of that with just the names in a row, and the actor who wasn't first complained and, like, threatened to boycott the movie. That's how petty they were about this. I, I honestly just do two separate posters. You'll even see as well that on the poster, their heads of their pictures are also slightly higher than one another. And it's the same thing that you'll see, look. Steve McQueen is on the left but lower, Paul Newman's at the top. So it ruins, like, you know, the... Um, that, that looks like a shit poster. It looks like the poster's a mistake, but yeah. that's the only way they could get the poster made and got past the, um, uh, the, the agents for both actors. It, it's fascinating, but it's also so depressing that that was a thing. But it gets even better because, oh. in addition to that, both men were paid the exact same amount. The story goes that Steve McQueen got really annoyed when he got the scripts. So he went through the scripts. Oh, like, oh that would, no. He's like, hang on a second. I've got less lines than Paul <laughs> Newman. <laughs> and, like, you know, he went to the script writer and he's like, what's, what's all this then? Why have I got less lines than, like, you know, Paul Newman's? Like, that's just the way the script came out. We had to combine two two premises. Um, your character appears to this. Like, rewrite it. So, what? Rewrite? I want as many, I want exactly as many lines as Paul Newman has. So the script writer went back, rewrote the entire script, and gave Steve McQueen twelve more lines, so that he would have the exact same amount of lines as Paul Newman did. And then, uh, according to a very persistent industry legend, they even went as far as to make sure they had almost the exact like amount of screen time down to the second so that neither actor could complain. So like in the editing process, they had to edit like, you know, seconds out of scenes starring a certain actor to make sure they have the exact same amount of screen time. God, it's like, when do you stop? Well, like, what cracks me up though? They way? could have complained that one of them added the line before the other or one was in more scenes or... You, well, that's the thing. Yeah, they said he was in more scenes. So that's to write more scenes and write ones without the other. And what makes it even funnier is if I was Steve McQueen and I was being paid the exact same amount as Paul Newman and I've got less lines... To me, that would make me think, well, I'm more important. They're yeah, paying me yeah. more money for less work. And I still got the same billing as he has. And I guess he's just a fucking idiot. Because in his mind, he's like, well, no, I've got to do the same work. It's like, you do- it looks better if you do less. Because you've got top billing despite doing fuck all. I guess, like, in that situation, I guess he doesn't care about the money. He cares about the presence. And what makes it even funnier is that there was a third actor in the movie who tried to get in on this, and the studio told him, fuck off. <laughs> because like, they went, he went, oh, I'm a big deal. I went, no, you're not. So you're, they, not you're not Steve McQueen. Yeah, you're not Steve McQueen. So they told it a to fuck off because his agent tried to argue, like, you're not getting involved. But anyway, yeah, that's how, you know, they combined two separate films into one super film. And, you know, we mentioned twin films earlier. Have you thought of any while we've been discussing it? I mean, the one I was thinking of was A Bug's Life and Ants. Yeah. Because, like, the plots aren't directly similar, but they do both feature like a young like a, a man an walk around going after the princess and 
some nebulous threat happening to them. But I, I prefer ants. Yeah, and I think they both have sex predators in because one's got Woody Allen and the other one has Kevin Spacey, I think. Oh, Kevin Spacey plays Hopper, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you have that amazing line, don't you, of like, a, um, d d imagine this is an ant. And he throws the, does that hurt? No. And then a million ants. He goes, if they all realise if they work together, they could overthrow us all. It would be the end of our society as we know it. And that's made by fucking, like, a giant <laughs> studio corporation. <laughs> if all of the people working who actually make the content and um, stuff that creates value for us realise, if they all rise up and team up together, they can overthrow us and they don't need us, we're fucked. The, I know the VFX artists for Marvel have now unionised. Oh, yeah. But, like, all, all those talk shows are trying to get back on the air without writers. Yeah. It just goes. It's going to be really funny when you like James Corden try to host his show without writers, and you realise how unfunny James Corden is. You know, like America is yours now. We're not having him back. <laughs> oh, that's one of the best exports we've ever had. Yeah, it's the greatest deal. Like we give you James Corden, we get fuck all. Yeah. What a deal! <laughs> Cheers, everybody.